Hi, I'm Terrell Turner, the host of the Law and Finance Show. And today we have a great guest on because one of the very real situations that a lot of lawyers find themselves in is, you know what, you figured out how to start running your business. But one of the things that you may not have figured out is, what does this mean for your personal finances? Like, what are some strategies? What are some, how do you budget? How do you plan for all that? Because for a lot of business owners, I mean, until a certain point, it does feel like it's just all over the place. So I wanted to bring on a special guest that focuses on helping lawyers figure out the personal financial side. So you don't want to miss today's guest. So stay tuned for today's episode. So without further ado, let me bring on my guest, Ro Thomas. Welcome to the show. Hey, Terrell. Thank you so much for having me. How's it going? It is going very well. Well, I will say I am in Charlotte, North Carolina, and today it is like a little, well, I'll say for North Carolina, it's a little uncomfortably rainy and cold today. Where are you located? I'm in Atlanta, and it is exactly the same here. Rainy, cold, and it's one of those weird things. Like the Southeast is so weird because last week we were in short sleeves, like maybe a light jacket. And then this week it's like 30 something in the mornings, high of 50. So I'm right there with you. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it has been an interesting change because I know actually last week I was in Atlanta, well, in, in Buckhead, I was teaching a finance workshop for like on the business side for a group of law firms. Mm -hmm. um, and the weather was pretty, it was pretty good when mm -hmm. I was there. <laughs> and then flip the switch and it was like bundle <laughs> up, it's winter time. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, before we jump too far into the details of the amazing work that you're doing with lawyers, you know, for those that may not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah. So as you mentioned, my name is Ro Thomas. I am a lawyer turned financial coach. I practiced trademark law for seven years and left the law to do the work that I'm doing now with helping lawyers learn to manage their personal finances better. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Now, I'm very curious, you know, what was it that kind of sparked that, you know, for you? Because that's not the typical story you hear of from lawyers of, hey, I did all this hard work. I went to law school. Hey, I was good at practicing law. And then I just decided to help lawyers with their personal finances. That's not a typical <laughs> story. So. Yeah, it's not. It's not very typical. Um, so mine comes from my personal experience with my own personal finances. Back in 2016, my husband and I had our first child. I was still practicing law at the time. And I was looking at this policy that the firm I was working with had where you could do a kind of part-time position or not a part-time position, but like you could do part-time hours. Um, so if you're familiar with the law firm model, I think it's similar in accounting actually, like, do you do the billable hours? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. we had the billable hour model and under this policy, I could do, let's say for example, 80% of the billable hour requirement for a year for 80% of my salary. And so I was considering taking advantage of that policy because I just had my first kid. I wanted to you know, balance a little bit more. I was like the type A doing all the things, like always working, you know, et cetera. But when we looked at our personal finances, we realized that we did not have the bandwidth to take advantage of that policy. We had over $670,000 of debt, most of which was student loans. Uh, we had about 200 on our house, like a $10,000 car loan, but the rest of that was student loans. And so we were like, okay, well, not really in a position to take a pay cut right now. <laughs> but that got us started on like looking at how to manage your personal finances better. Because to that point, we hadn't really learned a lot, like didn't learn a lot from our families in that regard. And like we had been doing you know, the things that you're supposed to do, like they say, save, you know, a little bit, we were saving, we were even maxing out our 401ks, 
but we weren't really paying attention to how we were managing the rest of that money. And you said you were here in Atlanta. You know, there are lots of great restaurants around Atlanta, and I know a lot of them got a lot of that money. So all of our, all of our efforts to um, manage our own personal finances better led to learning a lot about personal finances and then starting to chip away at that debt ourselves. Um, I started a blog back in 2018 where I was sharing our story. I didn't see a lot of people in the same situations. I was seeing a lot of like, oh, I paid off $30,000. I paid off $50,000, which is still a lot, right? But it wasn't the same level that we had. And I knew that there were other people who were in similar positions. So I started that blog, had friends, family, colleagues asking how we were doing it. And so that started this whole personal finance, financial coaching thing where I was helping people kind of on like a one-off hobby basis. And it wasn't until uh, 2020 that I actually started looking at doing it more as a, at first side hustle and now career. Gotcha. Gotcha. So I'm curious, I mean, as, as you said, you know, you wanted the flexibility um, when you were working. So at what point did you see yourself, you know, from 2016 to at what point did you actually get that flexibility you were working towards? Yeah, so it actually was uh, 2021 last year that I, I think before that I had done something like a 90%. So I did, I was able to take advantage of it for a little bit. But when the pandemic hit, I actually dropped down to 50%. And we were able to do that because we had done so much with our finances. We had been paying off that debt. We finished paying off the student loans at the end of last year, but we had significantly reduced it. And then, of course, the payments had been on you know, pause for a while as well. Um, but we were able to do that because we had paid off so much of it already. And then we also had been building up our savings and our investments and things like that. OK, awesome. Awesome. I love to hear that story. So there's a couple of things that I wanted to ask some questions about. I mean, I guess I'm curious if you found, you know, as people who may find themselves in a similar situation because law school is not cheap. Um, you know, under, I mean, undergrad isn't cheap these days um, to where do you find some people that look at the amount of debt that they have and just feel like, man, there's no way to get out of this. Yes. All the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a super common way of thinking about debt because like we do tend to have so much coming out of law school. Like on average, anecdotally, I'm seeing, you know, 150 to 250. Um, and then, you know, if you are not used to managing your money, you might get out, even if you're making a lot of money, if you aren't managing it, then you don't see the path to pay that debt off. And so a lot of people feel like it's just hopeless. And I tell people all the time that the way that you think about your debt is going to have a huge impact on the way that you manage it. Because if you feel like it's hopeless, if you feel like I'm just going to be in debt till the day I die, then you're not going to take the steps to look at how you could pay it off. Right. So you're not going to do that research. You're not going to figure out how to manage that cash flow better to create that. I call it a cushion between like your income and your expenses. Like for many of us, it's like income is here. Expenses are right here. Right. We want to have. <laughs> a little bit of a cushion there. And that way you can use that surplus toward your other goals, whether it's paying off debt, saving, investing, et cetera. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, you also mentioned about starting a blog. So, you know, what was it like in the early days of starting that out? Like, you know, as far as did you have any like mentors or any other people that you saw doing that that you kind of learned from or were you just kind of trial and error learning as you go um a little bit of both um it was very much trial and error there was some mentorship from afar like people who don't know that they were mentoring me right <laughs> like i was watching what they were doing along the way um there were some personal finance forums that i was in where people were talking about their stories and sharing their stories on blogs and things like that. Um, but a lot of it was very much trial and error. And when I first started out, I was doing it anonymously and I was very bad at being anonymous. <laughs> like I would accidentally <laughs> sign my name to emails. I'm like, oh, uh, I mean, 
<laughs> but I felt so much shame going back to that initial question that you asked about people managing their debt. Like I felt so much shame about where we were, especially being a professional, right? It's like, I am highly educated and I've got all this debt. How did I get here? And so there was a lot of shame there, which is why I was doing it anonymously. And then fast forward to today, I don't run the blog anymore, but I have a podcast where I share about our story. I share tips and things like that. And I've got my full name on there and putting it on blast. I just told people on your show, right? And I think when we can let go of that shame and the stigma around the debt, then we're able to move forward. Um, and I think going back to your initial question about like getting started and what doing the blog and such was like, I felt really good about the work that I was doing because I had seen other people's stories. And even though, like I said, they were, you know, maybe paying off less debt than we had, I was able to pull the pieces from what they were doing and draw inspiration from that for what we were doing. And so I felt really good about putting our story out there for anyone who was similarly situated so that they could see themselves or pieces of themselves in our story and get that inspiration so that they can keep going as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned shame because, you know, my wife and I have this conversation. Um, and then, you know, even last week when I was working with, you know, some of the business owners at the, the conference that I was at and one, you know, one of the questions that came up about like when your business goes through a cash crunch and stuff and, and how for a lot of people is, Anytime money starts to look lower than their this expectation that they've created, it seems like yeah. this shame sets in and the problem just only gets worse. And, and yes. so I'm curious what, you know, especially like, so let's say for lawyers, everyone knows when they're coming out of law school, there's a lot of people who have a lot of debt coming out of law school. I'm just like, if you know that this is probably the situation for most lawyers, I'm like, where does the shame start to like, how does the shame get in there knowing that, hey, this is kind of the normal for everybody? Um, because I, I find that, you, like you said, the people who can't get out of the shame, that they usually don't make progress. So yeah. I guess for you, it's just like, how did you kind of start getting over that shame? Well, I want to address first, like where the shame comes from. I think it comes from this pervasive idea that we have in our society that debt is bad and you're a bad person if you have debt. And sure, there is like, you know, the good debt, bad debt, but it's like only so much good debt, right? It's like, oh, but I have multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars of good debt. So that's not good anymore. So I think that's where a lot of it comes from. It's like internalizing this idea that debt is good or bad and mostly that debt is bad. Like, I don't believe in the good debt versus bad debt. I definitely did when I was starting out, right? Which is why I felt so much shame about it. But I realize now that debt just is what it is. It's very much a neutral number and different people can bring different opinions to it. And so an example that I give is like a lot of people when they come to me, let's say they've got $200,000 of student loan debt and they're feeling so much shame about it. And they think it's a lot of debt and they think it's so much and it's so bad. But if I go back to where I was, right? Starting at $670,000, 200,000 was great. I was like, oh man, we made it to 200,000. This is wonderful. <laughs> right. And so that just goes to show you that the number, right? The amount of debt is neutral in and of itself. It's not inherently good or bad. We bring our opinions to it based off of our own experiences and the way that we're thinking about it. So that's the first piece. And I think that is a big part of how I was able to get past the shame is thinking about my debt differently, accepting the fact that I had debt, not uh, resisting the fact that I had debt, like, oh, how did we do this? Oh, I'm so like, I can't believe that we're here. I'm so educated. This shouldn't be happening to me, right? Because this shouldn't be happening to me is never going to make you feel good, <laughs> right? Like telling yourself this shouldn't be, or I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be in this position. Like that's never going to make you feel good. And it's not true, right? Because the fact is you are here, you are in this position. And if I look at it, like I chose to take out this debt because I wanted to go to law school and I didn't have the money to pay for it. So yes, I should be right here, right? I didn't, at that point, I had been working for two years in 2016. I didn't take the time to look at my debt and determine how much money I needed to put toward it to start chipping it down. So yes, I, I should be right in that position because I didn't take those steps, but that's not a judgment or a criticism of myself. That's a like an objective look at the facts of what happened. 
right? And so when we can take that, um, the judgment, the criticism out of it and just look objectively at this is where I am. I have this amount, right? This number in my, my debt account on my debt balance. And these are the actions that I've taken thus far. They've led me to this. And going forward, I want to take these other actions that are going to lead to this result that I want. Like when we can do that, then you can separate out that shame and actually start making progress because sitting there beating yourself up about it and saying that you shouldn't be there and whatever else is never going to lead to you actually taking the steps that you need to take to achieve the goals that you have. Awesome. I love that. I mean, it reminds me of this, this was one quote i think i forget exactly when i heard it It may have been like years ago um i think i was reading a book it might have been by like andy stanley where he talked about where you will end up at the destination of the road that you're traveling on. yes so it's like if those are the decisions and the road that you're traveling on whenever you look up and see where you are you should be there because that's exactly. the road you've been on yes I think that's exactly it. And I think so often we will compare ourselves to this idealized standard of what should be, right? But there are so many studies that show that the majority of people, at least in America, I don't have you know stats on international, uh, international finances or anything, but the majority of people in America have some level of debt, right? Especially if we look drill down specifically to lawyers. I think it's like nine and 10 lawyers graduates with student loan debt and the majority of them is 100,000 plus. So like this idealized version of who you should be and you shouldn't have debt because debt is bad. It's just not true. And it's not useful to you to compare yourself to anyone else. Like I tell my people all the time, compare yourself to yourself, right? So we're starting here this month and you're deciding that you're going to pay off debt. When we look next month, we're comparing where you are next month to where you were this month to determine how you feel about that. And if you're making the progress that you want to be making, not comparing where you are next month to where somebody else is next month or where you think you should have been next month or whatever it is. Gotcha. You know, one of the things that I'm curious about is, you know, as you know, because my wife and I, we went through a journey of that ourselves. Like, um, And my wife was probably a bit more adamant about it before we got married about mm -hmm. she at the time she was listening to Dave Ramsey and she was extremely adamant about like paying this off, paying this off. And I was like, OK, all right, we, I'm, I'll get on board with this. Um, and one of the things that, you know, I guess that you experience in that process, well, for some people experience is while you're, you know, making those adjustments that you need to make to chip away at the debt and make progress on that, you know, for some people, it can just feel like this long journey that no progress is being made. So yeah. what do you usually say to, like I said, some of the people that you work with that as they're, you know, hitting those moments of despair of like, I've been doing all this hard work and it just doesn't feel like I'm moving forward. Yeah. So I would say, look for the ways that you are moving forward. Like often we will look at the ultimate goal and it's like, if I'm not at the ultimate goal, if I'm not at point Z, then it's, oh, I'm not there yet. Versus let's look at all of the points along the way, right? Finding those little mile markers that you can celebrate yourself early and often, and that helps you to stay motivated. So like you mentioned that your wife was on Dave Ramsey. I know he teaches this as well, but doing the debt snowball where you start with the smallest debts and work your way up. Part of the reason why that method is so effective is because you get those early successes, those early wins, right? I pay off, like for instance, with our our debt, I mentioned that we had 670,000, the smallest loan was like $1,500, right? So, all right, we paid off this 1,500, we got a paid in full letter. I'm like, okay, we're doing this, right? The next one might've been 2,000 or 2,500. Like, I don't remember the specifics now, but like, yes, 670,000 feels like a huge number. And we did have some six figure loans in there, but there were also some smaller loans that we were able to knock off quickly. Like at one point we were able to pay off a couple of loans in a month and then like one loan a month. And then we would pay off half of the loan in a month and the next, you know, and it just kept going that way. 
But as we did that, we were building up all of this evidence of our ability to do this thing, right? I paid off this loan. That means I can pay off the next one and I can pay off the next one. And when you look for those ways that you are succeeding, so even if I hadn't paid off 670000 I paid off 1500 I'm feeling pretty good about that versus discounting the 1500 which is what we often want to do. Like, oh, that was nothing. That was just 1500 I have 670000 right? <laughs> so it's like celebrating the things that you've done that are evidence of your success and the fact that you're doing it. So that's one. And then the second thing is just looking at this ultimate um, journey as like a choice that you're making, because sometimes I think we forget that that like I am choosing to do this, you could just sit back. Like people say all the time, I'm gonna die with debt. Like you could, if you wanted to, you really could, <laughs> right? But if you're choosing to pay this off, let's look at every action that you're taking then as a choice. And then it doesn't feel like, oh, I can't you know, go out to eat. I can't, whatever it is. And I don't believe in, like, I know um, Dave Ramsey and some other people mentioned like, cut out all the things and only put your money toward these goals that you have. Like, I don't think that we necessarily have to cut out all of the things to still manage your money better and to achieve those goals. I think that balance is key and you can still make room for going out to eat, going on vacation, going to do these other things, but you're choosing to maybe put less money toward those things so that you can put more money toward your goals. So I think those two things of finding those small wins along the way and then recognizing that everything that you're doing is a choice that you don't have to do, it helps you to reframe it so it doesn't feel like I'm just slogging along and it's never going to be finished. You know, I, I love that approach because I would say, I mean, in, in all transparency, I mean, for between my wife and I, we had to reach a point of a middle ground of agreement because I told her, I was like, I'm not doing the 100% Dave way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to have the stamina to just do it that way to where it, it became. But as you know, kind of more of what you said of just like, hey, making those decisions to put less towards, you know, some of the extracurricular activity things, but we still did different things. There were things that we did along the way. And one of the things that I'm curious from from your perspective, even in your own personal journey, um, is for me, I found that as the debt went down, and especially after, like I said, all like at this point, like I think like the only thing that my wife and I owe is on the house that we live in. So mm -hmm. it's like, as everything else, all that other stuff went down. It's just like, I started sleeping better at night. <laughs> Somewhere. Like, did you see, did something change for you as those numbers started going down and like the quality of your life? Yeah, I think the biggest thing for us was having that flexibility that we talked about that got us started on this whole journey in the first place. Right, having the ability to drop down to 50% and not be worried at all about where we were going to be financially, or having the ability to leave this job and go all in on a business, even though my business was not making the same amount that I was making in my firm, right? But we didn't have to worry about anything financially in that regard because of the work that we had done with paying off our debt, with building our savings, building our investments, et cetera. So I definitely saw a change in that where I was not concerned, like with the pandemic, there were, you know, furloughs and layoffs. I wasn't concerned if we were, you know, in like if we were affected because we had set up our finances for years prior, where even though when the pandemic first hit, we weren't completely finished paying off our debt, we were in a much better position than we had been back in you know 2016 when we first started. So I, I saw it from that perspective, but I think from the perspective of like sleeping better at night and that kind of thing, I didn't see that, but I think it's because I stopped resisting being in debt, right? Like I started to accept that we were in debt and that we had this plan. If we just followed the plan, then we would get there. And so it was like an inevitable thing like I knew that we were going to get there. I didn't necessarily know the exact date. Like I could not have foreseen the pandemic and the pause and you know all of that, but I, I knew that it was going to happen. And so I think I had come to the point that it was like, okay, this is where we are, but if we just keep working this plan, then we're inevitably gonna get there. Awesome, I love it, I love it. Well, I know I could talk to you a lot longer about this topic, but I know you have things to do. 
Um, so I do want to ask, you know, a couple of questions. You and I, we were talking before, you know, I guess before the recording went live and you mentioned about your podcast. Can you tell the people a little bit more about your podcast, where they should look for it? What should they expect when they go listen to it? Yeah. So my podcast is called Wealthy Esque. You can find it on my website and on any of your favorite podcast players. Um, and it is basically helping you to learn the mindset strategies and the like actual strategies for managing your personal finances better. I lean very heavily toward money mindset because I think that fuels all the things that we do. So talking about the shame, talking about learning to celebrate yourself, like all of that, because it's going to help you to take the actions that you need to take to manage your finances better. But we do also talk some strategy as well. So I put it out weekly and you can find it, as I mentioned, on my website. And that is at rowthomas.com. Awesome. Awesome. Now, for those people that are going to your website, are there other things on your website that they would really enjoy checking out? Yeah. So if you want to schedule a call with me, that pink button there is a way that you can schedule a call. And then on the homepage here at the bottom, uh, you can see a budget template. It's the budget template that my husband and I have actually used to manage our finances better. And I offer that to you as a way for you to organize your finances if you don't have a budget, because we didn't have one before. And as I mentioned, we were spending a lot of money, a lot of different places, and we weren't able to use that money for ourselves. So that budget template will just give you an idea of categories you can be thinking about as you're managing your finances. Feel free to remove, add whatever you need to do. It will just help you get yourself together because I believe that your budget is the foundation of your entire money plan. Once you've got the budget together, you've got your cash flow under control, you can achieve anything else you want to. Awesome. I love it. I love it. Well, before we wrap up, one final question. Um, you know, as a lot of people may, you know, come back and listen to this episode, if you were talking to someone and saying like, hey, I was on the Law and Finance show. And you know what? If you're going to go listen to that episode, here are two big takeaways that I want you to have from that conversation that I was having with Terrell. What would your two big takeaways be? Number one is the way that you think about your money and specifically debt, because we got pretty heavy into debt. The way that you think about it is going to color the way that you feel about it. And you have complete control over that. Like you don't have to feel ashamed for having debt. I think the second thing is what I just said about managing your cash flow and having your budget together. Once you're able to manage that and create that cushion between your income and your expenses, and you've got some money to work with there, you can direct it wherever you want to, to achieve whatever financial goal you have. Awesome. I love it. Well, Ro, thank you so much. Because like I said, usually on the show, we have, we're have talking about the business side of running a law firm. But one of the things that we realize is if your personal finances are out of whack, it definitely impacts your performance and how Agreed. you show up in your business. So thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah. Thank you again for having me. It's such a pleasure chatting with you. If you're looking for ideas on how to manage and grow a profitable law firm, this Facebook group is perfect for you because every week we are featuring conversations with successful lawyers and businesses related to law firms on tips, ideas, and technology that are helping many people grow and manage a profitable law firm. So if you're looking for great tips and ideas, you definitely want to click the link below so you can join the conversation and be part of the Law Firms and Finance Facebook group.